In the following lectures, we're going to focus on looking at the different physical states of matter. Those are um, gases, liquids, and solids. Um, and we'll start with gases um, and then move on to the other two. And we'll also talk about um, what allows us to understand how these actually behave in these different phases, which is something called intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the way molecules interact with one another that isn't actually bonding. And so if we had a couple of water molecules, um, they would have interactions between each other that were weaker than the interactions between atoms in, uh, the, that are actually bonded within the molecule, but based on the same guiding principle that opposites attract. Um, and if, if you want the fancier version of saying opposites attract, it's called Coulomb's Law. Um, but we'll find that these types of interactions um, between molecules, um, the stronger they are, then uh, we'll see molecules or a sample be a solid at higher temperatures. Um, or the weaker they are, we'll see something will evaporate at a lower temperature. And it'll also um, predict some of their physical properties a bit more. Because these are interactions between molecules, the amount of space between them is important. Um, solids and liquids are very close to one another. Our liquid particles are tumbling all around each other, constantly moving. Our solid particles stay in fixed positions relative to one another, and so are not moving. And our gas particles are zipping all over the room, and there's actually a lot of space between them. And so these forces that predict the behavior of our sample um, get stronger the closer our molecules are to one another and the more fixed their position is. So, um, oh, sorry, intermolecular forces are really strong in solids and liquids. But in gases, the particles are really far apart um, to the point that we'll assume the intermolecular forces um, don't affect their behavior. And so what we're going to do is first focus on gas behavior. Um, that isn't influenced very much by intermolecular forces. Then we'll talk about intermolecular forces and their effect on the behavior of liquids and solids. And then we'll look at its influence on phase changes between each of these three different phases. Um, so we'll really be looking at how these impacts this. And then as we move on into the next chapter of our book, then we're going to look at how IMFs affect how solutions form. So, the, uh, we'll start with gas behaviors, and that'll be the focus of these next few lectures. The way a gas behaves can be summarized by kinetic molecular theory. Um, it has a few assumptions that it makes that helps us predict how a gas will behave, and we see a close um, we see a, a close relationship between what you would predict with kinetic molecular theory and what you would measure in the lab. Um, so with that, let's walk through the, the different principles of this. Um, under kinetic molecular theory, we assume that um, gases are a series of particles that are moving very randomly and very rapidly. So we, I like to think of them as just like zipping up around the room until it hits something and then bouncing and zipping really fast flying all around. 
Um, these are gas particles have lots of kinetic energy. It's how they're able to move so fast. Um, and their direction is random. The size of the gas particle is going to be very small compared to the space in between them. And so our gas particles will have lots and lots of space in between them. And that's why we assume that they don't actually interact with one another. And so that's our next assumption within kinetic molecular theory is that gas particles exert no attractive forces on one another. That means that we don't have to consider intermolecular forces when we think about how they behave. And that's just because these molecules do not get close enough to one another in the gas phase to actually have any sort of interaction, any attraction or repulsion based on charges. The next um, part of kinetic molecular theory states that um, kinetic energy of gas particles will increase with increasing temperature. So as I increase my temperature of my gas, they will have more kinetic energy, which means they can move faster. Kinetic energy, remember, is the energy of motion. And our last assumption is that when these gas particles collide with one another, they rebound and travel in new directions, a lot like billiards, billiard balls. Um, we can also call this, if you've had physics before, um, elastic collisions, which means that they'll, when they collide, they'll bounce off one another and go the opposite direction, and they won't lose, or they, there will be no loss of energy. Now that's an assumption, they do lose a little bit, but um, we can perform calculations assuming they lose no energy and they'll match very nicely with what you can measure in the lab. So using these guiding principles about how a gas will behave, um, we can develop some equations that allow us to predict um, properties of a gas sample. So here are some of the physical properties of a gas, especially that, that come out of kinetic molecular theory. Um, one, it is going to expand to fill its container. So a gas will take on the shape and volume of whatever you put it in. Um, and these particles are moving fast and randomly, and so they can just fill up that whole space. Um, they're randomly arranged, disorganized, and far apart is how we think of their arrangement of particles. This strongly contrasts solids where we have a very fixed arrangement of molecules relative to one another. Because these are so far apart, the density will be very low. There'll be very little mass for a given volume because there's so much extra empty space. They move very, very fast and we assume that they do not interact with each other. So here are some of the um, variables that we'll be tracking when it comes to studying gases. Uh, we have pressure, which we'll abbreviate P, and there are lots of units for pressure, lots and lots and lots. The ones we'll work the most with are atmospheres and millimeters of mercury. You may have seen TOR before or um, PSI when pumping up your bike tire. Pascal's uh, millibar is usually seen when we talk about weather systems. Um, and this is a measure of the number of collisions and the force of those collisions between a gas particle and its container walls. So it's really the force that a gas is exerting up against a container wall. So when it hits, it's that force here. Then we have volume of a gas, which we abbreviate capital V, and we'll keep this in units of liters. 
So if you see it in milliliters, please change it to liters. And we'll do that with one of our metric conversions, that 1,000 milliliters equals one liter. And this really talks about the size of whatever the container is the gas is in. Um, similar to how we measure the volume of a liquid, we can measure the volume of a gas by knowing the um, amount of space inside of a container. Then we have the temperature of a gas, which we'll abbreviate capital T, and we'll measure this in Kelvin. Um, we'll make sure it's always in Kelvin so that way we have no negative numbers. Um, because if we include um, degrees Celsius, we could calculate things like negative volume, which is a hard thing to wrap your brain around um, what volume is if it is not positive. Yeah, I can get myself confused there. Um, and temperature is going to be uh, proportional to the average kinetic energy. And so we really think about this as a measure of how much these particles um, are moving. And then our last variable we'll look at is the number of moles that we have of a gas particle. And we'll use the abbreviation lower case n, and its units will be moles. And this is how we're gonna track the amount of the gas particles that we have, similar to how we tracked these in chemical reactions. All right, so we're looking at pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. Pressure, I think, is the one that is newest of all of those um, different variables. We've talked and used temperature and volume quite a bit already, and we've recently introduced moles and started using it. So I'll stop for a second and talk a bit more about pressure. Um, so as we defined earlier, it's when these gas particles collide with a wall of a container, they are exerting pressure, they're creating pressure. Um, and it's really, that pressure is just the amount of force over an area. And so that area is the space of the container wall that is hit. And the force is really the amount of energy it's hitting the wall with. And so this is going to depend on the kinetic energy of the particle. So as the kinetic energy increases for a particle, it will hit with greater force. And so pressure increases. So you can think of pressure as how, as being how hard are all the gas particles hitting you in a moment or a wall. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as I said, we have a lot of different units that we um, use for pressure. In the chemistry lab, we use atmospheres the most and millimeters of mercury. Um, millimeters of mercury we use a lot because we still um, measure pressure using mercury barometers. Um, and atmospheres are, are nice because one atmosphere really corresponds to the pressure, the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Um, since we live in Seattle at sea level, um, most of us have a sense of what one atmosphere of pressure feels like. It's what you're experiencing right now, most likely. Um, and so this is really what I'm giving you here are conversion factors. So we can convert between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury or millimeters of mercury and PSI. So I would interpret this to say that 760 millimeters of mercury equals 14.7 PSI. And I can use these conversions just like my metric or English conversions that we used in chapter one. Um, so take a look at this example problem um, and I will solve this in a, an, another video. Um, and this is really just looking at uh, these conversions and getting a little practice with converting between different pressure units. 